welcome everybody on this gorgeous fall day to this fantastic gathering celebrating 50 years of what is the finest regulator in the world. So I'm gonna take us back a bit more than 50 years to the people who actually s set the foundation for us to become the finest regulator in the world. And um, I remind everybody that the Atomic Energy Act was signed on August 1st, 1946 uh, by Harry Truman. And when the AC opened the doors in, uh, on January 1st, 1947, they took over the Manhattan Engineering District wartime facilities and had approximately 2,000 employees. Remember that number, right? Because it's a number that actually matters. The first nuclear reactor to produce electricity was uh, anybody but Tom. No, I'm kidding. Um, it was the Experimental Breeder Reactor 1, which became operational in 1951 at Idaho, what's now known as the National Labs, right? The Idaho National Labs. In 1958, the first commercial nuclear power plant became operational at Shippingport. Um, so by the time um, the Reorganization Act, the Energy Reorganization Act, was signed on October 11th, 1974 by President Ford, there were about 50 power plants operating in the United States. And I'm going to ask Owen to, to adjust this for inflation, but the NRC budget at that time was $148 million. And the NRC managed a staff of about 2,200 people. So with that bit of background, it is now my pleasure to introduce the chair of the US NRC. The Honorable Christopher T. Hansen was reappointed as chair of the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission by President Biden to a second term ending June 30th, 2029. Chair Hansen was first sworn in as commissioner on June 8, 2020, and designated chair by President Joe Biden, effective January 20th, 2021. Chair Hansen has more than two decades of government and private sector experience in the fields of nuclear energy. Prior to joining the NRC, he served as staff member on the Senate Appropriations Committee, where he oversaw civilian and national security nuclear programs. Before working in the Senate, Chair Hansen served as senior advisor in the Department of Energy's Office of Nuclear Energy. He also served in the Office of the Chief Financial Officer, where he oversaw nuclear and environmental cleanup programs and managed the department's relationship with congressional appropriation committees. Prior to joining the department, he served as a consultant at Booz Allen Hamilton, where he led multiple engagements for government and industry in the energy sector. Chair Hansen earned master's degrees from, Yale, from the Yale Divinity School and the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, where he focused on ethics and natural resource economics. He earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in Religious Studies from Valparaiso University in Valparaiso, Indiana. Chair Hansen. Thank you for that uh, introduction, Morella. Before we get started this morning, I wanted to just take a minute to um, uh, extend my, uh, my thoughts and my support to all the folks who are facing down Hurricane Milton. Uh, and of course, recovering from Hurricane Helene, which I think was much more significant and impactful than uh, a lot of us expected. And it certainly, um, I know, has uh, impacted a lot of, a number of members of the uh, NRC family. And um, 
we're thanking, you know, I wanna be thinking of, of all of them, but also thank uh, the folks who are down in, in Florida and Atlanta and down at uh, Turkey Point and, and St. Lucie uh, getting ready for Hurricane Milton uh, as well. Uh, we've got the, the, the engineering inspectors out of Atlanta going down there to backfill the residents so that they can be with their families like we always do in these cases. Um, we've got the folks uh, in Atlanta monitoring the situation, and of course we've got NRC staff in Tallahassee as well working closely with the state, and I just wanna thank everyone who's involved in all of that uh, for their service this morning. So a warm uh, welcome to you all. What a great day uh, here at the agency. The 50th anniversary committee has been working tirelessly uh, to put together an, ag an agenda worthy of this momentum oca momentous occasion, not just today, but really over the next uh, several months. And boy, have they delivered. Uh, so I'd like to add my sincere thanks to Vana and everyone else on the 50th anniversary team for putting this event together today. And, and what it is a treat. So today you're gonna hear from current members of the commission, uh, our very own historian Tom Wellick, uh, as well, and this is the really great part, former commissioner uh, uh, Dr. Victor Galinsky, uh, former chairman Dr. Shirley Jackson, and former chairman Dr. Richard Meserve. It's an honor to have so many NRC greats, so many legends with us here today. So this is gonna be the first of a number of events. And let me just tell you, this is not over the next six months an exercise uh, in nostalgia. Uh, it's an opportunity, I think, for inspiration, for growth, and for looking ahead. You know, I've spoken a lot about our legacy in speeches uh, over this last year, about how NRC's history is one of continuous learning, of overcoming challenges, of rising to meet the needs of the future. And today, we're here to look at this history, to understand our story, to remember just how much the past implicates the present. So let's go back to October of 1974. Olivia Newton-John's honest, I Honestly Love You is at the top of the Billboard 100. <laughs> The nation is gearing up for the Oakland A's to prevail over the LA Dodgers in the 1974 World Series, a historic three-peat for you baseball fans out there. The newest addition to the National Mall is the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. And later in the month, the world will watch Muhammad Ali regain his world heavyweight title by knocking out George Foreman in the eighth round of one of the most historic boxing matches of all time. But pop culture aside, the nation is facing a turbulent time. Richard Nixon had resigned as President of the United States over the Watergate scandal that August, leaving Gerald Ford to lead the country in his stead. The Vietnam War is still ongoing. Uh, the American troops had pulled out of the conflict only a year prior. The oil embargo of 1973 and unrest in the Middle East resulted in a nationwide fuel shortage the year prior, creating an energy crisis in America that will continue for the next decade. Inflation is at 11%. And that was a lot lower, that was even lower than what it was gonna end up with being by the end of that decade, compared with 2024's 3%. We have two major themes that ultimately set up passage of the Energy Reorganization, Reorganization Act of 1974. The immediate need for energy security and a push for government transparency. Congress was acting out of the urgency of the moment. Nuclear was projected to play a critical role in solving the energy crisis and bringing the nation the energy security it sorely needed. But the Atomic Energy Act, or the, excuse me, the Atomic Energy Commission, the regulator and the promoter at the time did not have the public trust, primarily because of that dual role. America needed to facilitate production of energy quickly and public acceptance was critical to its success. This all leads up to President Gerald Ford signing the Energy Reorganization Act on October 11th. Tom Wellick and the Office of Public Affairs have prepared a video that will deep dive into this moment, recounting the events that led to its final signature. And our distinguished guests, Dr. Galinsky and Dr. Jackson and Dr. Meserve, will lead us through some of the most significant moments in NRC's history. Today, we're celebrating the beginning of the agency, but it isn't just our beginnings that matter. 
The experiences of our honored guests remind us that this agency has successfully adapted to formidable changes over the course of decades, building on our expertise and adding to our legacy along the way. The Browns Ferry Fire, Source Security Incidents, Fukushima, 9-11, and the NRC's most searing crisis, the Three Mile Island Accident, are all important moments leading us to become the regulator that we are today. In our 50-year history, the NRC's commission and staff have pioneered and improved probabilistic risk assessment tools, wrote regulations based on risk insights, developed the principles of good regulation, and codified innovative regulations such as the maintenance rule. We put resident inspectors in the field, implemented the reactor oversight process, upgraded force-on-force -force exercises, and developed and distributed radi radioactive source tracking tools at home and abroad. Today, the NRC is again in the energy policy spotlight. We find ourselves in a different moment, in a different time from 1974, but with a similar sense of urgency. Once again, energy security is at the fore, and now the threat of climate change has shifted the, dyna the dynamic. Congress passed the Accelerating Deployment of Versatile Advanced Nuclear for Clean Energy Act, or the Advance Act, earlier this year and I'm grateful for their leadership. I see this act as a vote of confidence in the agency during a time of ma major change in the nuclear landscape. The NRC was already on a journey to bake risk-informed thinking into everything we do, to ask how and the why of our processes and drive toward improvement. The act gives us further direction and encouragement and the tools to move forward. One item that I know is uh, has caused some consternation among the staff is the revision of the NRC's mission to include efficiency in its licensing and regulatory duties alongside the agency's historic health and safety directive. In my view, efficiency is not the enemy of safety. Efficiency does not mean cutting corners or simply doing things faster or with less resources. Here's an excerpt from the agency's very first report to Congress uh, and to the executive branch in 1975. And I quote, in some instances, efficiency calls for regulatory change. In others, it demands regulatory stability. During its first year, the commission established several operating principles and took steps to apply them in all NRC activity. These initiatives sought to enhance the ability of NRC to perform its safety, safeguards, and environmental missions. And here's the key part. By improving the effectiveness and efficiency of its regulatory processes, assuring the objectivity and independence of its decisions, and keeping the agency open and responsive to the public it serves. Note, efficiency here isn't used in negative terms. In fact, the report uses the word efficiency 16 times in that first report and highlights it as an important part of the agency's strategic work to meet its mission. I know sometimes change is daunting, but today we look at the changes that brought us to this moment and we celebrate them. We celebrate the evolution of the NRC into a global example of a premier nuclear safety regulator. Our story is built on the legacy of decades of committed public servants just like you and everyone here is part of the next chapter. One day, I hope, we will be asked to recount these moments, these times, the decisions we're making today. I am so proud to be here making history with all of you. And now, I'm gonna hand it over to Tom for the aforementioned video. Take us back in time, Tom. For almost 30 years, the Atomic Energy Commission wielded almost unchallenged authority over the development and regulation of nuclear energy. But by the early 1970s, it faced significant criticism that it promoted nuclear power more than it protected the public from its hazards. As a result, on October 11, 1974, 
President Gerald Ford signed the Energy Reorganization Act, dissolving the AEC into the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and ERDA, the Energy Research and Development Administration, which was later merged into the Department of Energy. I'm Tom Wellock, the historian at the NRC. In this video, we'll explore the congressional battle over the Energy Reorganization Act. AEC skeptics and supporters agree the agency had outlived its usefulness. Their key dispute was, what should replace it? Opponents of the AEC wanted to completely break up the agency and scatter its programs among agencies with no allegiance to nuclear power. Supporters wanted to speed the adoption of nuclear power by creating agencies built from the AEC's foundations. In creating ERDA and the NRC, pro-nuclear forces triumphed yet it proved a hollow victory that did not secure the nuclear future they imagined. The first major threat to the AEC came in 1971, when President Richard Nixon proposed a cabinet reorganization that would dismantle the AEC. Its civilian nuclear research functions would go to a Department of Natural Resources. The Department of Defense would take AEC weapons programs, and what became the NRC would have been absorbed by the Environmental Protection Agency or the Federal Power Commission. In Nixon's plan, there would be no Energy Development Agency and no independent Nuclear Safety Commission like the NRC. Blocking Nixon's path stood Congressman Chet Holifield. Mr. Atomic Energy, as he was known, was opposed to any move to destroy the AEC. Chairing the House Committee overseeing Nixon's cabinet reorganization, Holifield had considerable leverage. The White House, however, knew Holifield wanted to solve a looming energy crisis by building a liquid metal fast breeder reactor capable of producing more fuel than it consumed. White House staff recommended holding breeder funding hostage unless Holifield agreed to break up the AEC. Holifield turned to the powers of persuasion. In early 1971, Nixon invited him for a ride on Air Force One. The congressman told the president the breeder could give him something to talk about besides the Vietnam War, give the nation energy to last a thousand years, and give Nixon a political legacy rivaling President Kennedy's space program. Nixon was sold and released breeder funding. As it turned out, Nixon's reorganization plan threatened so many interest groups, it never came to a vote. Holifield had won lavish breeder funding, Nixon's Natural Resources Department was dead, and the AEC was safe, or so it seemed. Nixon explored other ways to gain control of the AEC, taking advantage of the agency's safety controversies and its slow pace of new reactor licensing the president replaced outgoing commissioners with loyalists who promised to reform the agency and ready it for the breakup Nixon still favored. Alarmed by Nixon's maneuvers, Holifield offered to split the AEC into a general energy research agency with ample breeder funding, but with some non-nuclear research too, and establish an independent regulatory commission that could speed reactor licensing while assuring the public it could maintain safety standards. For Holifield, creating ERDA and the NRC solved the same problem, how to accelerate the adoption of nuclear power while satisfying critics. In 1973, the congressman won an unexpected ally in Dixie Lee Ray, the AEC's first female chairman. A professor of zoology, the industry press dismissed her as, quote, a spinster who would be a mere caretaker until the AEC was broken up. Instead, Ray became a bruising political infighter and a forceful advocate for Holifield's legislation. Ray's unconventional lifestyle charmed the press. Living in a 28-foot motorhome, she brought her two dogs to the office, sporting her trademark white knee socks and a disarming wit. Described as Washington, D.C.'s most powerful woman, a trade publication admitted the industry had laughed at her, but, quote, they're not laughing anymore. By mid-1973, Nixon, 
plagued by Watergate scandal, seeded the legislative initiative to Holifield and Ray, who pressed forward with creating IRTA in the NRC. Holifield's legislation in the House ensured breeder development dominated IRTA's research budget, but he granted environmental and fossil fuel interests modest commitments to diverse energy research. He rejected amendments offered by nuclear critics to limit the NRC's independence and impede licensing hearings. In December 1973, Holifield's bill won overwhelming House approval. The Senate was more friendly to the AEC's critics. Some lawmakers there still favored putting IRTA in a large natural resources department. But the 1974 energy crisis made creating an energy agency like IRTA a priority. Chairman Ray said a natural resources agency bill would pass, quote, over my dead body. And in the spring of 1974, Senator Abraham Ribicoff announced the natural resources bill would not advance. Nuclear power opponents had more success attaching amendments to the NRC's legislation, empowering them to influence commission membership and slow power plant licensing hearings. In conference negotiations, however, Holifield stripped out virtually all of these contentious Senate amendments. Admitting defeat, Senator Ribicoff explained that action on the energy crisis was, quote, so important that we don't have the temerity, frankly, to delay this thing any longer. IRTA and the NRC began operations on January 19, 1975, amid euphoria over the perceived pro-nuclear victory. Expecting little change, an industry observer wrote, the AEC is dead. Long live the AEC. For the NRC, nuclear power executives were reportedly, quote, positively bubbling over with enthusiasm in anticipation of streamlined reactor licensing. Nuclear power's brighter day was not to be. Weighed down by technical and economic problems, Congress eliminated breeder funding in 1983. The 1979 Three Mile Island accident compelled a tightening of NRC regulations and poor economic conditions led to a collapse in nuclear plant orders. The Energy Reorganization Act was a turning point, but not the one its authors envisioned. It committed the nation to diverse energy research and development, and in the NRC, independent regulation of nuclear safety through open and efficient processes. That is a legacy for which supporters and skeptics of nuclear power can take credit. I don't know about you, but the first thing that comes to mind is the Advance Act and the strong bipartisan support that it had. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is those who don't learn from history are bound to repeat it. So with that, with those two serious notes, I'm going to, to move to another very pleasurable thing, introducing Commissioner Wright. Um, the Honorable David Wright was first sworn in as Commissioner of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission on May 30th, 2018. He's currently serving a term ending on June 30th, 2025. Commissioner Wright was owner-president of Wright Directions, LLC, a strategic consulting, policy development, and communication business focusing on energy and water. During this time, he also was a member of the Advisory Council of Bipartisan Policy Center Nuclear Waste Initiative. As an ex-official member and Chairman Emeritus of the Nuclear Waste Strategy Coalition, an ad hoc organization representing the interests of the industry, state official, local governments and tribes, and consumer advocates. From 2004 to 2013, Commissioner Wright served the South Carolina Public Service Commission in a variety of capacities, including vice chairman and chairman. 
from 2011 to 2012, he served as president of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. He had previously served the association in other capacities, including as a member of the executive committee and board of directors. From 2010 to 2013, Commissioner Wright was a member of the advisory board of the board of the directors of the Electric Power Research Institute. Previously, he was elected councilman and mayor in Irma, South Carolina, and to the South Carolina House of Representatives. A colon cancer survivor, Commissioner Wright is an advocate for cancer awareness and education and the former member of the Leadership Council for Cancer Centers at the University of South Carolina. He was presented with the Community Champions Award by Molina Healthware, Healthcare of South Carolina in 2016 and the Blue Star Service Excellence Award by the USC Center for Colon Cancer Research in 2014. In 1996, he received South Carolina's highest citizen honor, the Order of the Palmetto. Commissioner Wright received a bachelor's degree in political science from Clemson University. Please join me in welcoming Commissioner Wright. Good morning. Thank you for reading my obituary. Um, <laughs> may I rest in peace. Um, <laughs> uh, this is a very hard act to follow uh, with the chair's comments and with Tom's presentation. That was awesome. Um, and I have a lot of follow up because of that that I'm going uh, to ask you about. Um, you know, wow, this is really a special day, uh, uh, the 50th anniversary of this important agency. Um, when I was preparing my remarks this morning, I was thinking about what my voice could add, especially given the many distinguished guests that we have with us here today. You know, compared to most of you, um, I'm a fairly new kid on the block when it comes to nuclear. I didn't become involved in this sector until later in life, uh, but I've been in the trenches long enough now to see how far we've come, and I have a good sense about where we're headed. The future for nuclear is bright. Right now, at this moment in time, the stars have aligned in the nuclear sector in a way that um, I've not seen or experienced in my lifetime, and I've heard from many of you the same comments. The need for climate conscious power, the av availability of financing, advances in reactor technologies, Vendors have customers who want their technologies. The desire by industry to invest in and use micro, small, and advanced reactor technologies both on and off grid. And both political and public sentiment are aligned in a large way. The NRC is an important part of that equation too. So it's a great time to be at the NRC. We are an important part of the solution the equation that I spoke to of the nuclear future before us, and we're in a position to enable the safe use of these nuclear technologies, both here and around the world. We've heard about pivotal moments in the NRC's past, and we know how the agency navigated those challenging times in its history. Today, as you heard the chair mention, the NRC has another opportunity to make a positive difference in history as a new frontier in nuclear technology and innovation unfolds right before us. Congress is asking us to do just that too through their passage of the Advance Act. An overwhelming majority of Congress on both sides of the aisle clearly said that the status quo at the NRC is not going to be the future of the agency. So as we look to the horizon of the future, remember, the foundation we lay now, the decisions we make now, are going to be used by generations to come. We have an opportunity to be part of something very, very special. We can create a regulatory framework now that will be the foundation for reactors to come. 50 years ago, we weren't thinking about 
what micro reactors would be in the futures or what they would look like or if they would even be possible. So we made decisions based on our assumptions at that moment in time. Some we got right, some we missed the mark a little. But we did not let the future or the unknown paralyze us. We know what reactors look like today and we already know that tomorrow's advanced reactors are gonna be very different. Some might even be fusion based. So I hope we'll take our understanding and learnings of the past as well as our understanding of the unknown and use them to position the agency in a way that allows us to create a regulatory framework now, today, that is flexible and inclusive of the many different and novel technologies being created and it will work for years and decades to come. The flexibility is needed now and for a successful future too. So thank you for allowing me to speak this morning. It's great to see all of you and I look forward to the rest of the celebration today. this. Um, next, it's my pleasure to introduce Commissioner Caputo. The Honorable Annie Caputo has, was sworn in as a commissioner of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission on August 9th, 2022, and is serving the remainder of a five-year term ending June 30th, 2026. Commissioner Caputo previously served on the NRC Commission from 2018 to 2021. Commissioner Caputo has over two decades of government and private sector experience in nuclear energy and security policy. Commissioner Caputo has a distinguished career as a nuclear engineer and policy advisor and has made significant contributions related to federal nuclear energy policy. Prior to her most recent appointment as an NRC commissioner, she consulted for the Department of Energy Idaho National Laboratory, promoting international collaboration on advanced nuclear reactors. Prior to her work at INL, she served a short-term assignment with the U.S. Senate Armed Services Committee, where she assisted with the National Nuclear Security Administration's portfolio. Prior to joining the NRC, she spent over 13 years as a staff member in the U.S. Congress advancing key policies and initiatives related to nuclear regulation, science and technology, energy, and the environment. She served as senior policy advisor for Senator John Barrasso and former Senator James Inhofe, when each were chairman of the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee. Notably, she supported the Senator's work on nuclear energy policy and NRC oversight. From 2005 to 2006, and again from 2012 to 2015, she worked for the House Committee on Energy and Commerce, overseeing a variety of nuclear energy issues. She supported then-Chairman Joe Barton and Fred Upton with oversight of DOE and NRC. Prior to her positions on Capitol Hill, she worked for Exelon Corporation in a variety of positions of increasing responsibility in both nuclear generation and governmental affairs. She earned a bachelor's degree in nuclear engineering from the University of Wisconsin-Madison with an emphasis in communication. She previously studied chemical engineering at Michigan Technological University. Early in her career, she worked as a ski instructor and patroller and served as a volunteer firefighter emergency medical technician. In addition to her many accomplishments, she brings ingenuity to her hobbies as an avid quilter and crafter. Please join me in welcoming Commissioner Capito. Thank you, Morella, for that introduction. And thank you, Commissioner Galinsky, 
Chair Jackson, Chairman Missouri, for being here today. Uh, I have to say, with Morella noting, I received my degree in nuclear engineering in 1996 uh, when Chair Jackson was serving here at the NRC. And I never for a million years would have dreamed that we would be here together for this event. Uh, so it's a special honor for me uh, to see you here today. And I also want to thank Tom for that bit of history. I certainly learned a lot in that presentation. So <clears throat> it also uh, gives me an opportunity to skip quite a section of uh, what I had in here <laughs> for a trip down for a trip down memory lane. Uh, so as noted already, NRC has accomplished so much over 50 years, and much is expected of the agency in the coming years. So part of preparing for the future is acknowledging and learning from the past. So thank you, Tom, for that, that bit of the origin history, and also to the chairman and his remarks for mentioning, mentioning some examples of events that have in the past shaped this agency. Um, many examples that shape the agency happen outside the agency. Some are driven internally. And both of those can drive regulatory responses by the agency, but also influence our culture. So some regulatory responses were implemented by those that came before us, like Three Mile Island, and many have left remarks, left marks on our culture that remain today, like Davis Bessey and the establishment of the principles of good regulation. But as a team, we hope to build on the work of those that came before us and incorporate the lessons they learned into our culture as foundations for decisions yet to be made. The lessons we choose to learn from this history will influence how we all work together and shape the agency's future. In 1990, Commissioner Ken Rogers worked with his colleagues in a bipartisan fashion, including Chairman Carr, Commissioners Roberts, Curtis, and Remick, to develop our principles of good regulation. 34 years later, these principles remain a prudent and insightful framework that guides our decision making today. Looking toward the future, though, the demand for clean energy is accelerating domestically and globally, driven by clean energy needs and efforts to decarbonize. Both Congress and the administration expect nuclear energy to make a growing contribution to meeting our energy security needs here at home and our geopolitical objectives abroad. It is auspicious that Congress passed the Advance Act this year as we are celebrating passage of the Energy Reorganization Act 50 years ago. This reflects Congress's recognition of the growing importance of our role and the anticipation of our future. As I said at our all hands meeting, we at the NRC are gatekeepers for the safe use of nuclear here at home, and that is our first priority. But our regulatory decisions also reach beyond our borders and are respected around the world. The manner in which we execute our mission impacts our national energy security needs and the nation's strategic objectives abroad. Our mission is incredibly important, not just for the safety and security of the American people, but also as part of a much bigger picture. The Energy Reorganization Act remains a sound foundation on which this agency has built 50 years of nuclear safety and security, a history rich with experience. Today, we honor that past. Going forward, we must build on the work of those who came before us, remain true to our mission and steadfast in our principles, and together shape the agency for success in this new clean energy future. Thank you. As Morella comes, we do want to thank those that are standing in the back of the room. Just for your awareness, we are having some chairs that are placed out in the exhibit area should you want to sit there as well. Thank you. That's the staff for us. They're troopers. Thank you all. Um, and finally, it's my pleasure to introduce Commissioner Crowell. 
The Honorable Bradley Kroll was sworn in as a commissioner of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission on August 26, 2022, and is serving the remainder of a five-year term ending June 30, 2027. Most recently, Commissioner Crowell served as director of the Nevada Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, first appointed in 2016 by former Nevada Governor Brian Sandoval and was reappointed by Governor Steve Sisolak in 2019. At DCNR, he led approximately 1,000 employees across eight divisions with a budget of nearly $300 million. Commissioner Crowell has more than 20 years of experience in the fields of energy, environment, natural resources, climate change, national security, including executive leadership positions in the federal and state government. He previously worked for multiple members of Congress, including former Nevada Governor and Senator Richard Bryan and Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Commissioner Crowell served in the Obama-Biden administration at the U.S. Department of Energy from 2010 to 2016 and was confirmed by the Senate in 2013 as Assistant Secretary of Energy for Congressional and Intergovernmental Affairs. Commissioner Crowell is a native of Carson City, Nevada, and graduated from Santa Clara University in Santa Clara, California, with a bachelor's degree in political science. Please join me in welcoming Commissioner Bro Crowell. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> standing up here now and looking back at the crowd, I've realized uh, how full the room is today, which is great, as it should be uh, on this occasion. Uh, I am not in an envious speaking position today as the most junior member of the commission to have to go after my commission colleagues and before our distinguished guests uh, is uh, a cer certainly a daunting task. So I'm going to keep it uh, light and, and relatively short. But uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm humbled and grateful uh, to be here with all of you today to celebrate uh, the NRC's 50th anniversary. Um, uh, I it, am looking forward to hearing from our special guests uh, today and, and at lunch. Uh, there's so many questions I think we all want to ask. Um, one of you I have met before, but I don't think you know who you are, so uh, we'll have fun with that uh, trivia question uh, later today at some point. Um, <clears throat> But, you know, it, it's notable, uh, each of you served uh, at the commission during uh, pretty notable times and, and left a legacy that um, we still have today, and thank you for your, your leadership. Um, Tom, that was a great, uh, a great video. It, uh, it's quite a contrast to where we are today with the amount of bipartisanship we have over nuclear uh, issues uh, and the breadth and amount of legislation that's been passed uh, focused on nuclear, which, you know, these days, legislation doesn't get passed very easily. We are an outlier uh, in this field in terms of the interest from Congress and um, their ability to uh, give us uh, bipartisan direction. Um, we should look at that as a vote of confidence and use it to our advantage as the beginning of the next 50 years of the NRC. As we look to the future, I wholeheartedly believe in innovation and new ways of thinking and doing. Uh, it's going to be the only way uh, we achieve success. Um, and in fact, just this morning, I learned a new lesson uh, in, in knowledge management myself. Um, always, uh, always save your work on the share drive, uh, <laughs> because I was, as I was tinkering with my remarks last night, um, I saved them on the hard drive of my NRC tablet, and then um, I my card reader would not work this morning to log into my computer and save those remarks. So um, you're getting some, some last minute uh, revisions uh, on top of the fact that those who spoke before me and those who spoke after me make it a pretty tough act. Um, that being said, uh, we're really here today to celebrate uh, all of you, um, all, of our, all of our employees, past, present, and future. Um, the, the work you do is gonna be, is gonna be make the difference uh, in, the, in the years ahead. Um, I've been, in my two years on the commission, I've just been extremely grateful to work with all of you um, and learn what you do and how dedicated you are as, pu as public servants. Um, I uh, uh, took a book off the shelf in my uh, office last night to kind of get my head thinking about 
today's events, and I ended up not being able to put it down, and it was uh, one that many of you have probably read by um, Tom's predecessor, our NRC historian, called Permissible Dose. It looks, and the title and the book cover look incredibly boring. It's, it looks like a textbook you wouldn't want to pick up. As soon as I started turning pages, it, to me it read like a novel, which either means um, uh, Sam was a very good writer or I've drank the water here at NRC and I'm as, a, I'm as big of a nerd as you all are at this point, or at least trying to be. So um, uh, thank you for, for having me in that, in that regard. Uh, you know, t today is a day for, for, for celebration. Uh, I'm fond of saying that if you don't celebrate your successes, you'll be defined by your failures. Um, uh, today is a, is a day to reflect on our, our many successes over the years and think about the successes to come going forward. Um, I'll close with just a few anecdotes of what 50 years uh, looks like to me. Um, 50 years is barely older than I am, barely. Um, <laughs> when I served at the Department of Energy, I could always remember how old I, old I was because it matched the, the year I was born was the year DOE uh, officially became uh, the cur their current incarnation. Uh, Commissioner Galinsky, your first term uh, uh, began before I was born. <laughs> and I say this all with reverence and love to all, all three of you. Uh, Chair Jackson, your, your term ended the same month and year I graduated from college and moved to DC. Um, uh, Chair Reserve, uh, you were working on your PhD at Stanford at the same time my father and uncle were undergraduates at Stanford. So uh, we can explore that in more depth as well. Um, and, and, and lastly, one of the, 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 the differences between being at, uh, serving at DOE and now here at the NRCs uh, is my initials. So my initials are BRC. We're all fond of using initials around here. Well, at, at DOE, that was, that was the Blue Ribbon Commission. But here at the NRC, I'm below regulatory concern. So um, I, I, I feel at home in, in, in both environments. And, um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, so much has happened in the last two years since I've been here, and I just look forward to the time ahead. Enjoy today. Uh, uh, congratulations to us all, past, present, and future, for the 50th anniversary. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Morella. Thank you. to throw away these here written remarks after that speech. <laughs> but it is, you know, um, those of you who know me well know that I am uh, seldomly awestruck and lacking for words, but I'm about to be awestruck and lacking for words in introducing our guests today. Um, I'm going to start with the Honorable Victor Gilinski who was a commissioner here. Dr. Galinsky received a Bachelor's of Engineering from Cornell in 1956. Uh, he received his doctorate in physics from Caltech in 1961. Uh, the same year, he began working for the Rand Corporation as the head of the physical science department. And he stayed there until 1973. And the NRC was very fortunate to have Dr. Galinsky begin serving uh, here in 1975, and he stayed with us for uh, until 1984. He was appointed by President Ford and reappointed by President Jimmy Carter. Dr. Galinsky has worked as a freelance consultant since that time. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Galinsky. Make sure this microphone works. Um, Thank you for including me. It's an honor to be here. And um, hard to follow the humor in the previous <laughs> speech, but um, uh, there's some serious things I want to say. Um, I want to say a few words about uh, why the creation of the NRC was so important and why it continues to be important. You know, it isn't absolutely necessary for a uh, regulatory agency to be an independent agency. The FAA has everything under one roof, 
works pretty well. But it didn't work well with the Atomic Energy Commission. And I think the fundamental reason was that they were seized with a kind of grand vision of the future of nuclear energy. And they didn't want anything to stand in the way of that. Uh, their highest priority uh, was a project that was mentioned in the, uh, in the uh, movie. Uh, it was a fast reactor. The um, commission expected that to be completed and to be followed by hundreds of orders and eventually thousands of orders. Um, and unfortunately, they also believed that the regulators, which were part of the AEC at the time, were a hindrance to this projection. Uh, and the result was that they pushed the regulators down. I was there, I worked at the regulatory part of the AEC, I worked in the other part, trust me. <laughs> um, now, pushing the regulators down didn't help the fast reactor project. It was so unrealistic commercially that not one of them was ever built. But it did have an effect on the, the uh, light water reactors that were being licensed at the time. Weak regulation left them with problems that the new NRC had to, in its first years, uh, basically fix. Now, let us fast forward to the present. Uh, the Advance Act has been mentioned several times. Uh, the, the new legislation tells the agency not to unnecessarily, is the word unnecessarily, limit the benefits of nuclear energy and emphasizes uh, efficient licensing. Now, the NRC is a, has emphasized efficient licensing for many years. So why this? Well, uh, I also looked at the Energy Department's webpage, and they're talking about the new law making it, it says it will help them build, and this is a quote, at a clip that we haven't seen since the 1970s, um, build these new fast reactors that are now in vogue. Um, unfortunately, many people in Washington don't understand what most of you understand, which is that uh, safety requires careful examinations of designs and uh, careful attention and uh, in order to avoid serious errors. So my message is, be wary of sliding back into the AEC mode. I also want to tell you a story that in a way approaches this from a different point of view. Uh, it's about Admiral Rickover, uh, the founder of the nuclear navy, and it was mentioned, the shipping port was mentioned, that was, uh, he was the one who built the first power reactor commercial, not commercial, but civilian power reactor. Uh, he was famous for his rigorous attention to safety and uh, his emphasis on continual improvement in performance. I think that part's really important. He was a hard man, a tough man. Somehow he took an interest in me. He, he was much older, of course. Uh, perhaps it was because we both came to America as six-year-old Jewish kids from Poland. But anyway, he did take an interest in me. And he uh, arranged for me to spend three days on one of the nu nuclear submarines. It was a shakedown cruise. Uh, it was the Memphis, if anybody was involved in the Navy. <laughs> and uh, it was from Newport News down to Savannah. They dropped me off there and went on. Uh, at one point, it was very exciting. At one point, I thought we were starting World War III. <laughs> uh, but that's not why I'm telling you the story. <laughs> uh, 
I, when I got back, I called to thank him. And he said, I don't want to hear that. I want to hear what you learned and how are you going to use it in your job. Well, I was taken aback. I, didn't, I wasn't ready to respond. I said, commercial reactors are different, bigger than the ones that he uses. And he said, no, the principles of safety are the same, and the discipline that's required is the same. And then he went on and gave me a rather severe lecture on the subject, uh, some of it unprintable. Um, but then he paused and he said, look, you have an important job protecting nuclear safety. Make sure you do it well. He thought that everyone should do their best. And uh, in the same vein, I pass his advice on to you. You all have a, a very important job protecting the public. Make sure you do it well. Thank you. There is not one of us on the staff who doesn't believe that our job is important and that we need to continue to do it well. Thank you for those words. Um, it is now my, my pleasure to introduce Chairman Jackson. The Honorable Shirley Ann Jackson is the President Emerita of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, the oldest technological research in university in the United States. She served RPI for a remarkable 23 years before retiring in 2022. A theoretical physicist, Dr. Jackson holds a science baccalaureate in physics and a PhD in the theoretical elementary particle physics, both from MIT. Before taking the helm at Rensselaer, Dr. Jackson was chairman of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission from 1995 to 1999. At the NRC, Dr. Jackson conceived and promulgated risk-informed performance-based regulation and created a new planning, budgeting, and performance management process. Under Jack Dr. Jackson's leadership, the NRC advanced the Convention on Nuclear Safety at the IAEA, which was signed by over 170 countries and remains in force today. Described by Time Magazine as perhaps the ultimate role model for women in science, Dr. Jackson is the recipient of 57 honorary degrees, numerous awards, and she has served on numerous presidential commissions and advisory boards. She is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, the American Philosophical Society, and the Council on Foreign Relations, where she served on the board of directors from 2008 to 2018. She is an international fellow of the British Royal Academy of Engineering and the American Association for the Advancement of Science, where she served as president in 2004. Please join me to warmly welcome. Well, good morning. Good morning. It is indeed an honor and a, a pleasure to uh, be with you today, and so I want to particularly greet uh, Chair Hansen, Commissioner Wright, Commissioner Caputo, Commissioner Kroll, the EDO, Gravillis, uh, and of course Tom Wellick, who will put us through our paces later, uh, honored guests and staff of the uh, U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And so I'm pleased and honored to be a participant in this 50th anniversary celebration of the creation of the NRC. Now, I know some of you may look me up online, so I might as well give you the great reveal here this morning. And that is the year and the month 
that the original Atomic Energy Act was uh, signed and put into force was the year I was born and the month. <laughs> now, I've been asked to uh, speak a little about my tenure here and the implementation of risk-informed thinking. But it is important to understand that risk-informed decision-making had its roots in earlier work at the NRC, as well as the broader strategic context that was extant as I began my tenure here. Now, I also want to say that it's important in a job like this not only to talk about uh, what one's responsibility and, and one's mission uh, are, but in fact to get things done. So I've always felt it was important to be a visionary and a pragmatist. It's good to have a vision, but one has to understand how to put things into place to get things done, and I hope I'll be able to illustrate a bit of that today. But also one has to take advantage of one's window in time and, and what uh, the challenges one is faced with and then the opportunities that are presented. And so there were broader national and international geopolitical drivers as well as specific regulatory concerns facing the NRC as I began. A key driver was the passage of the Government Performance and Results Act or what we called GIPRA, which mandated that each government department or agency, federal government department or agency, develop a strategic plan. And that derived from that, that given department or agency develop an approach and associated performance metrics to assess its work. There were specific regulatory concerns as well, deriving from aging nuclear power plants, especially with a growing interest in license renewal, and concerns related to the weaknesses exposed by the shutdown of the Millstone nuclear power plant, which we shut down for over two years. There were concerns about the perceived cumbersomeness of the NRC regulatory process, the need to move away from what I dubbed good guy versus bad guy regulation, uh, meaning that one had a view of a licensee. And once that mental view was uh, developed, that that would be the lens through which that licensee would be dealt with. And I'll come back to that. But there also were concerns about the number of potentially undocumented changes to the safety envelopes of the U.S. nuclear plants because of numerous modifications to key systems in the plants, including changes meant to be temporary. There also were concerns, as there are today, about high-level nuclear waste or spent fuel disposition. Now, after the Chernobyl uh, explosion, the safety of the plants of the Chernobyl design, the so-called RBMK reactors, as well as broader nuclear nonproliferation and safety concerns in the newly independent states arising from the breakup of the Soviet Union and in post-apartheid South Africa all came into focus. So I initiated a strategic assessment of the NRC, which led to the agency's strategic plan, undergirded by three elements. One, reaffirming the fundamental uh, health and safety mission and responsibilities of the NRC, two, improving the regulatory effectiveness of the agency, and three, positioning the NRC for change. So we then developed the planning, budgeting, and performance management process, known as PBPM, which was designed to more clearly uh, link and directly link strategy, budgets, and associated activities to performance targets and measure progress against goals while performing corrective actions as needed. And this put the NRC on a more business-like footing by linking everything the agency did in its regulatory actions to intended outcomes related to protecting public health and safety. We also drove, and this was something I was particularly uh, focused on, 
a requirement for all nuclear power plant operators to fully update their final safety analysis reports to ensure that the as-configured plants remain within the original engineering margins and safety envelopes to which they had been originally designed and built. Given plant modifications that may have been made to key systems over time. Now this caused a bit of an uproar. Let me be honest. <laughs> a lot of uproar across the nuclear industry. But, and this was at the back of our minds, but it turned out to be important for license renewal, which was another process laid out during my tenure, leading to the first plant receiving a 20-year license extension in Dick Meserve's term, I did that for you, Dick, <laughs> in 2000. <laughs> However, this was not enough uh, because the NRC needed a new way of thinking about and approaching its regulatory oversight of civilian nuclear activities. I felt that it was a propitious time to drive in that direction because of two earlier developments. First, in 1975, the reactor safety study, so-called WASH 1400, had been published, which quantified in nuclear activities and facilities the probabilities of accidents with adverse consequences for public health and safety. Second, in 1995, a policy statement had been issued formalizing the NRC commitment to expanded use of probabilistic risk assessment, PRA, in its regulatory activities, but progress toward this goal was slow. So, Chairman Hansen, you'll appreciate this. In the fall of 1997, we issued a white paper from the chairman's office within what we called a risk-informed, performance-based regulatory perspective that defines safety and, and compliance within such a framework. Now this paper was written because the terminology, which I had begun to articulate, was being misunderstood and misapplied. Safety was believed to be presumptively assured by compliance with regulations that were based on experience, testing, and of course expert judgment, with consideration given to engineering margins and defense in depth. But the paper recognized that not all regulations had the same value from a risk perspective and argued that purely risk-based judgment alone, however, were, were not the intent, but that enhancements should and could be made to the usual regulatory approach through consistent use of PRA. So we sent this paper to the full commission for its consideration and endorsement. But, sad to say, it got no traction with the commission. So we decided to send the paper to key staff offices and to the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards, the AC, RS, for their review and commentary. Their review and related suggestions were useful, and the paper came back to the commission for its approval as SECI 98-144 with substantially the same approach that the chairman's office had outlined. Now the, the paper provided terms and definitions and outlined how a risk-informed performance-based approach could be applied to rulemaking, licensing, and inspection. It was approved by the commission in early 1999 and began to move the implementation of true risk-informed performance-based regulation and was the basis of the development of the new Reactor Oversight Program, or, or the ROP. Now, the new Reactor Oversight Program laid out an approach to developing baseline risk-informed standards to evaluate regulatory performance by identifying the safety significance of an event or condition using, as much as possible, PRA tools. Now, this event or con condition and you all know this probably better than I, was given a color related to its safety importance. And if the performance of a plant led to a degraded condition relative to that item, 
the plant would be placed in a performance column driving more or enhanced oversight. And this was the true essence of risk-informed performance-based regulation. One focuses on what is most important, but one does it in a rigorous way. But then one provides the oversight based on performance, not based on a subjective judgment of who's leading the plant. And so I'm interested, in fact, to see how this approach has been implemented and how it has evolved over the years. Interestingly enough, I am told that in 2015, in the aftermath of the Fukushima plant damage and shutdown due to the Great Sendai earthquake and tsunami, the Japan Nuclear Safety Institute reached out for NRC support in modeling their revised uh, nuclear plant oversight program that it, they wanted based on the NRC reactor oversight program. And in 2021, Japan commissioned its new risk-informed performance-based reactor oversight program. And the important point here is that this validates a belief uh, as played out in a country that experienced a very serious uh, nuclear event of the importance of having the right risk framework in uh, the work of the NRC. Now, in all honesty, there is so much more I could tell you about developments and accomplishments of the NRC during my tenure. And uh, our EDO, your EDO, uh, laid out some of them, including, of course, license renewal, the actual process for it, the privatization of the then U.S. Enrichment Corporation, the USEC. As you heard, the promulgation and eventual ratification by the U.S. Senate of the International Convention on Nuclear Safety, the formation of the International Nuclear Regulators Association, and these prior two things still exist, uh, the work to use PRA to upgrade the safety of the RBMK design reactors. And this was after working with the newly independent states to reconstruct the design basis documentation of those plants. We also worked with the post-apartheid South African government, as well as these newly independent states to develop overall nuclear regulatory frameworks and to train their inspectors. They actually came here. But alas, I can't talk but so long. But the point being, these are not just my accomplishments. These are accomplishments of this great agency. And it is a great honor and pleasure for me to see that a number of them are still in force or key elements of them today. And so we walk through our window in time and we accomplished a lot at the NRC during my tenure. And importantly, the NRC continues to move forward to meet new challenges and opportunities, including the increasingly complex issues today. And the Advance Act is your moment in time. But it is a, appearing against the backdrop where one has to always understand the message that uh, Commissioner Galinsky uh, left us, which is if we lose our uh, focus on safety, but safety in the right way, that the support we think exists for nuclear power can be a mile wide and an inch deep. But it also means that we don't have to be cumbersome in what we do. And so the risk-informed performance-based framework was meant to help us move beyond that. And so I want to say congratulations on all that you have accomplished as you continually strive for and achieve excellence in your very critical work. And thank you for uh, inviting me to share some of my experiences here and to spend this time with you today. So happy birthday, Nuclear Regulatory <laughs> Commission. God bless all of you.
So I'm very happy to tell uh, the Honorable Shirley Jackson that everything she talked about is still in the very active vernacular of us, the staff. And on a personal note, um, Red Guide 1174 is my North Star. So, um, <laughs> she, she's, so, last but certainly not least, I have the pleasure of introducing the Honorable Richard Meserve, who is Senior Counsel in the Washington DC Office of Covington and Burling LLP. He is the President Emeritus of the Carnegie Institution for Science and former Chairman of the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission. He obtained his PhD in applied physics from Stanford University and the JD from Harvard Law School. He served as law clerk to the Supreme Court Justice Harry, Harry Blackman. Dr. Meserve served as NRC chairman during the agency's 25th anniversary and led the agency's response to the 9-11 terrorist attack. So I, I have to insert a personal note. Um, I was faculty at the University of Maryland when Chairman Meserve came, came to visit. And what I remember, you know, I, I didn't really appreciate the difference between staff, chairman, you know, I hate to say that. But what I remember is the charisma um, that you, you left us all with. So he remains active in nuclear safety issues. He is the former chairman of the International Nuclear Safety Group. He recently served as chair for the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine study on advanced reactors. And he is currently serving as an external advisor to the Japanese Nuclear Regulatory Authority, the regulator established after the Fukushima accident and has received the Order of the Rising Sun, Gold and Silver Stars from the Japanese Emperor for his service to Japan after the accident. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Philosophical Society, a fellow of the American Physical Society, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and a foreign member of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Please join me in welcoming um, Dr. Mazar. Good morning. I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to join with you today to this uh, really wonderful occasion that you have. Uh, very distinguished history, as you've heard from many of the others. I actually was present in this very room 25 years ago when we celebrated the 25th anniversary of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And um, I've thought back on that period and contemplated the things we were discussing then and the things were still considering today. You know, Mark Twain is said to have made the comment that history never repeats itself, but it does often rhyme. <laughs> uh, and I think that's very relevant as we think about what we were talking about, what we were worrying about 25 years ago, and what we're considering and worried about today. So I've just list a few of them. It turns out, <laughs> that at the 25th anniversary, we contemplated there was going to be a nuclear renaissance. Uh, we had concerns about staff resources and capability, and of course, it didn't occur, but we prepared for it, and we were worried about the surge of license applications we were going to receive. And of course, you're in exactly the same situation today, where, and I think it's real this time, that you're, uh, you're already seeing a lot of business that's going to continue, but that was very much uh, a common issue 25 years ago. We were also worried about advanced reactors, that at the time, uh, Exelon was talking about a pebble bed reactor 
that they were going to bring to us for licensing. And of course, that raises as a gas cooled reactor. It was going to raise all sorts of issues that were quite different from the light water reactors that we were uh, familiar with dealing with. So, of course, uh, this was something we were worrying how are we going to deal with a license application that we anticipated and told was going to be coming. It didn't arrive. But of course, you are in the middle of exactly the same process today with a whole series of different types of reactors. Uh, you know, uh, fast reactors, as we've heard about, liquid metal reactors, uh, molten salt reactors, as well as gas reactors. And of course, advances in light water reactors as well. As we've heard uh, uh, Shirley Jackson talk about, we were contemplating in the middle of license renewal. Uh, the first, she indicated that the first license renewal occurred during my tenure here, that was Calvert Cliffs, came forward and I remember an event uh, that we did that. Um, and you know, that is very much with us. Uh, we have almost the entire fleet now has gone through a license renewal. Uh, and you know, I really believe that the most important action that the federal government has taken to respond to climate change has been the actions in renewing the licenses of existing reactors. That has provided a capability for nuclear power to buy low carbon energy that would not exist but for the contribution that reactors make and are going to continue to make. Because that issue is still with us. You have a few remaining reactors that you're dealing with. For the first uh, uh, extension of licenses to 60 years, and of course now you're dealing with subsequent license renewals, and you're going to be dealing with a lot more as nuclear reactors continue to be an important part of our response to climate change. As Shirley's indicated, we were very much involved in risk-informed decision-making, risk-informed performance-based decision-making. My term saw the first implementation, impl first implementation of the reactor oversight process, which has uh, now resonated across the world. I've been very much involved in Japan on the implementation of that process, which they was a direct copy of what we've done here at the NRC. And of course, this is, remains a foundation for all of the uh, regulatory activities that are undertaken here at the NRC, is that Risk Insights has, was really driven by the NRC as an approach to much more sensible way to approach problems, and that has really proved to be a foundation for us and as a result of actions by the NRC of regulators around the world. Um, we were in the early stages then as well, 25 years ago, with the renovation of the licensing process. Part 52 was uh, just in the early stages of implementation. We did a lot of work on sort of putting all the regulatory framework in place and sort of advertising how it was proceeding. And of course, you're grappling with these, exactly these same issues as, as they've evolved over time uh, in dealing with the next phase of the modernization of the regulatory process. We were, as yet another issue, we were very worried about the disposal of spent fuel. Uh, we were dealing then, <coughs> during my term, with the Yucca Mountain license, putting new regulations in place to deal with Yucca Mountain in anticipation of getting a uh, license application. At last is one of them I can say we've solved. Um, of course, I'm, uh, we haven't, and fortunately, this is a problem that is still with us. It's not a failure of the NRC, it's a failure of the political process uh, in which we must work. That it's, uh, this is obviously a problem that has to, be, has to be solved. It's not an imminent problem, which means it's very easy to put it off and we have lacked the political courage that we need to undertake to fulfill it. That's not the, something by a failure of the NRC, it's a failure of our political system. So I mentioned these things as uh, parallels from 20 years ago, because they strongly resonate with the matters that, with which you must deal. I think we've made pr significant progress on many of these things over where we were 25 years ago, but obviously there's much that remains to be done. Well, uh, as I think about the future as well, I think there is one way in which the work of the NRC is different, the context is different from what we were dealing with 25 years ago. It's my view 
that the NRC should be seen as a vastly more important agency than it was 25 years ago. We were an important agency 25 years ago, but we're much more important now. And why do I say that? I think we understand that climate change represents an existential threat. We have to deal with it. And there is growing recognition that nuclear power, and this is something that's evolving as really significantly over the last year, that nuclear power has to be part of the response. We're gonna have lots of renewables, and we should have lots of renewables, but they're not gonna be the full answer. And we've seen with the growth of electricity demand, incredible, astonishing growth in the demand that we're seeing as a result of uh, artificial intelligence and the demands of the data centers that greater interest in nuclear power if we're gonna be able to power our economies in ways that respond to the climate change challenge. So uh, I see a very important role for the NRC in re responding to a crucial social issue. And so uh, I see that, uh, that this is something that is hugely, makes this agency hugely important and we have to achieve it with the highest standards of safety and security as we go forward. The mission of the NRC is more important than ever. So congratulations for a job well done over the past uh, 50 years. I appreciate that you're doing and I contemplate there'll be wonderful success over the next 50. So thank you very much. I think I was instructed to we take a seat. Ahead. Absolutely. So, while our distinguished panel is making themselves comfortable here, I'd like to take a moment and acknowledge Dr. Tom Wellock, who will be moderating the, the conversation. Um, so Tom is interesting. I want to add a personal note because I remember asking him about the history of some, it probably had to do with ECCS, emergency core calling. And I went to ask him, and I expected a historical perspective, right? Because he's the historian. Well, I got a lot more than a historical perspective. I got the technical perspective. So, but I don't think that until today, I realized how those two, the history and the technical, merged so beautifully in our own Tom, Tom Wellick. So I'll tell you a bit about how he came about to do what he's gonna do. So he joined the NRC in 2010 in the office of the secretary, and he is the author of, are you ready? Great question. Safe enough? Um, a History of Nuclear Power and Accident Risk. It was published in 2021, and I have a signed copy, which I'm enormously grateful for. So prior to joining the NRC, Tom was a professor of history at Central Washington University. He earned his bachelor degree in mechanical engineering, worked as a reactor test engineer at the electric boat shipyard in Groton, Connecticut, and as a systems engineer at the davis Bessey Nuclear power station uh, in, in Ohio. He also received his PhD in history from the University of California at Berkeley. I and all of us who work with Tom will miss him greatly when he will retire. Um, huge shoes to fill. And with that, please go ahead to, to the panel conversation. <laughs> Um, I was going to save these two quick questions for the end, but I'm going to get them in now. Um, first, from all of you, just to go quickly uh, up the row, what's the best thing that the NRC has ever done in your experience? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Galinsky, we'll start with you. I'll tell you, well, you know, I want to take credit for one thing personally, which I did myself. 
I mean, I had to convince the other commissioners, but they didn't seem to care about it. And that is creating the Office of Historian. <laughs> Well, okay. <laughs> Dr. Jackson. Of course, creating the Office of the Historian. <laughs> but I would say that the uh, NRC has persisted through thick and thin. And because of its work, even with all the ups and downs, it is what has brought us to this moment that we are uh, contemplating and can help to bring into existence the next renaissance in uh, nuclear power. And, and so that, in a sum, because there are so many things that the agency has accomplished that it's very difficult to say the one thing. I really think the um, most important thing the NRC do has done is to serve really as a pathfinder for the world on nuclear safety issues. You know, that Wash 1400 uh, has truly has indicated the Rasmussen report sort of provided the foundation for probabilistic risk assessment, which has, uh, has driven the world to really understand that you should focus on the risk important things, not the ticky tack fouls, and that the focus of regulatory activity should be there. In the world, that's as a foundation, but then the specific applications of uh, regulations of ones that have been a model for other countries uh, as to how to proceed. So I, I think that really the most important thing we've done is not only the path-breaking changes we've made that have helped the achievement of safety in the United States, but really the achievement of safety around the world. Okay. Now, back in 1999, Dr. Golinski, you were uh, on a television program, and you were asked to predict the state of the nuclear industry in 2025. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Oh. In 1999, you were on a television ship program, and you were asked to predict what the state of the industry would be like in 2025. What did I say? <laughs> <laughs> Get this. You said, if global warming really proved to be a major problem, then we would come to rely on nuclear power, quote unquote, in a big way. And if not, then we would be phasing it out. Not well, bad. I think uh, the reality is more modest. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's an important component, no question. And, uh, but, um, yeah, I, I, I think my own view is that you ultimately have to meet a market test, and uh, nuclear power has had trouble doing that. Um, we'll see whether the new generation of plants succeeds or not. Meet the market test, yeah. Well, um, along those lines, um, since it's now almost 2025, um, I'd like my panel to predict where the industry will be when we are celebrating our 75th anniversary in 2050, we will, of course, ask you all back to uh, <laughs> defend your answers. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, I think that the climate change issue is one that's going to drive uh, the continued application of nuclear power. Now, there is opportunities for some sort of black swan events that may interfere with that. If fusion ends up being a reality, for example, there might be a transition. Um, but that's far from a sure thing today. I mean, if, you know, geologic hydrogen were uh, to be, uh, that is his natural origin of hydrogen, which is um, something that a lot of companies are exploring now, far from a sure thing, would have a huge impact on climate change. It would affect how we drive our transportation system, and we might use more hydrogen. But I think that absent a sort of a black swan event of those types, I think we could anticipate continued reliance on nuclear power and uh, on into the future to not only meet electricity needs, but actually to provide electrification of things that are now driven by fossil fuels. Dr. Jackson. Well, I, I think that nuclear power has to play uh, a, a critical role going forward. I do think, as Dick has said, 
absent uh, real black swan events, uh, there's no reason to believe that will not happen. But I will offer um, two caveats. Um, one has to do with the fact that we can't just look on the generation side of energy need, but on the demand side or the consumption side. And there are uh, activities that take up as much uh, energy and electric energy use as transportation, and, and we've got to think that through. Secondly, we have to figure out how you transition an economy where the use of fossil fuel products are very, the, their use is very embedded in everything not just transportation, not just energy generation, but in pharmaceuticals, in uh, clothing. So these are things that I think have to occur against the backdrop of a more uh, reasoned and comprehensive uh, energy security uh, policy and what the impacts on our overall economy will be. And then my last comment is one that says we don't think as much as we should, although the NRC has a role on the nuclear side, in terms of what the, the extractive industries. Because we talk about the uh, electrical generation using nuclear power, but the sources have to be garnered, and those sources, at least today, depend upon extractive industries. But then so do uh, some of the newer technologies, because without lithium, without cobalt, and so on. And those things are done abroad, and primarily. And on the one hand, it has shielded us from all the little things that have to do with what's not so nice about extractive industries. But on the other hand, it has created vulnerabilities for us as a country because of our dependence on other countries. So I always, you know, and in the end I'm a professor too, that I always like to have people think more broadly. And then the final comment is the one that uh, Victor said, which is um, it has to meet a market test. Dr. Galinsky, you get the last word. 20, what, uh, what predict, what's your prediction for 2050? You know, <laughs> you can't predict hardly anything. It's so uncertain. We've made so many mistakes. I mean, you know, going back to the Atomic Energy Commission, just imagine, they put all their chips on the fast breeder. Everyone agreed, and they had this beautiful vision. I have to say, I was an analyst at RAND. I was caught up in this, too. Uh, and everybody was wrong. I mean, if you look at Seaborg's, Seaborg was the chairman, Glenn Seaborg. If you look at his book, uh, he says, you know, all our assumptions were wrong. He admits that, because the whole thing was based on there not being a lot of uranium around. And, uh, yeah, and so you had a, it's very important to make complete use of it rather than just using the 235, uh, the natural 235, and turn it into, you know, the 238 into plutonium and so on. Well, it turned out there's a lot, the world's made of uranium. So uh, you have to be careful. I mean, everybody can be wrong and everybody, everybody can agree and be wrong. <laughs> so. Could ask our chairman. Oh, <laughs> oh Dr. Jackson. <laughs> uh, boy, yeah, I mean, it was. Uh, <laughs> let me agree with Dr. Galinsky, first of all, by uh, I think it, it, I had in mind, I think it's often ascribed to Yoga Bear, right, that uh, predictions are hard, especially about the future. Uh, so let's start there. But, but, um, to pick up on a couple of things. I think over the next 10 or 20 years, we're gonna try a lot of different things in the nuclear space. We're gonna try a lot of different technologies. We're certainly gonna rely on the, uh, on the technologies that are proven that we have today, the, the PWR and BWR 
technologies. And I hope in 25 years we will have proven that some sector of the operating fleet is still going and has been uh, and has proven to be safe and that can continue to support uh, the society that we have. But it's all these other use cases out there too. And I agree with Dr. Galinsky that um, uh, that there has to be an economic test. And I know, like Dr. Jackson said, it's economic tests applied to a wide range of uh, sectors where nuclear could be uh, applied. But my hope um, is that because energy in a way has not heretofore incorporated the social and, and environmental and economic costs of climate change, that once you factor those in, it becomes pretty apparent that um, uh, the, these um, and that the benefits are included, the benefits of carbon-free generation like nuclear are included in that, that the economics then kind of pencils out. You know, I, my answer was going to be the thing about the future is it's just that, and you know, I'm not a crystal ball reader particularly. But my father always taught me something, and, and he said, one, you can't always control everything around you and everybody else. But what you have the greatest control over is yourself and, and what you do. And I think that applies here, particularly for a regulatory agency. We can't know completely what is going to happen 10 years from now, or t certainly not 25. But what we can do is to say, given the challenges and the opportunities we face now, what are the maximal things we can do to advance that future? And, and I think that is, you know, something that we can all think about and, and try to live by. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> I, have a, I have a question. Uh, this, is, this goes back to this point about, um, you, know, you, you, you know, you operate under assumptions and, uh, and there's always this element of surprise. And uh, certainly there's been that part of us in, in, uh, at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, and so I'm curious, uh, I'll start with Dr. Galinsky, but I think this deals with uh, for all of you. Um, you came to the NRC as a commissioner, but you'd already been at the Atomic Energy Commission for a couple of years. You must have had certain ideas about what you thought were going to be the major challenges uh, that the NRC confronted. When you left nine years later, how had all that changed? How did the NRC change or how did I change? I think, I think, I think part for you as well. Um, well, as far as the NRC or the nuclear world, you know, you, you can't imagine what kind of bureaucracy the AEC was. Uh, you could not breathe the word accident without saying highly improbable in front of it. Uh, you know, uh, fires or rapid oxidations, you know, things like that. <laughs> so, uh, and, and you know, and, and to be serious, I mean, they ruled out uh, in licensing, they ruled out severe accidents. So there was just a, you know, a mindset. Uh, and, and with opening things up with the NRC, that changed, especially, of course, after Three Mile Island, people could talk about, you know, you can't solve the problem if you can't talk about it. And in the AEC, you really couldn't talk about it. Uh, so that has been a huge change and, uh, and, and terribly important, uh, not only here, but throughout the world. Uh, as far as me, I think, um, you know, as I said earlier, I, you know, I'd sort of gone along, assumed that, that all this stuff about the breeder and everything was, was, uh, was correct in the, as trying to draw consequences from that. But you, you realize you get in that, you know, it's, it's different. I'll tell you the one thing that impressed me the most when I came in. I, I had, as an analyst at Rand, I'd followed correspondence between the chairman of the AEC and the I think the Defense Department, and I, you know, I wrote about it and so on. I came here, and I got the original copies, and there are like 12 approvals below. You know, it went up the chain, then it went over to the other day agency, went all the way down the chain, then came up the chain. Well, that's kind of a revelation about how the government works, you know. Um, 
well, I changed my thinking, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, one thing about the, you, you talked about the openness, you, you attributed to part to TMI, but did people come into this agency, come to the NRC committed to being more open, or was that really something that really uh, happened later? Well, I, yeah, I don't know, I, I, at the time I came in, there was a sort of a sudden excitement about uh, uh, sabotage and so on. Uh, there was a book written by, uh, God, I forget their names now. I knew them both, but, uh, and so I was kind of looked upon as somebody who, who dealt with the security part, and then I kind of broadened out. You know, even with a, background, a technical background, you go in and see how complicated nuclear power plants are. That's just incredible. Uh, and uh, all the things, you know, that have to work together, so, that, that impressed me. I, I, th I think people don't realize that, I don't think there's anything that has this breadth of, you know, from concrete to electronics, you know. Uh, anyway. Dr. Jackson, I do want to ask you a question. Of course, uh, you, uh, you coined the term risk-informed performance-based regulation. And so uh, I do want to ask you, has risk-informed performance-based regulation played out as you envisioned it in the 1990s? Well, it is an evolving thing. <laughs> I think the, the probably the best realization of it um, has been the reactor oversight, the new reactor oversight program. Um, and I didn't just, and, and I just want to, this may sound a bit self-serving, I didn't just coin the words. We laid out a framework and, and we did it very deliberately and then we, we, had, we sent it through the staff and it came back. So, it just, so, so I think it's very important to be very precise. <laughs> <laughs> and because I don't, I think sometimes the hardest thing to do as a leader is for people to understand that everything you, you're trying to do uh, links to the overarching goal, in this case of adequate protection of public health and safety. And so risk-informed performance-based regulation is an overall approach. It says we have tools, and frankly, with the advent of newer tools with data analytics and AI, things like PRA can be more robustly done. And, and so one has to try to use those tools, but blend them with understanding of the engineering designs and margins that these plants were built with. But over time, that changes. People make changes to the plants. The plants get old, things don't work. And so you have to fold that back in. That was the point of the FSAR exercise. So to just kind of pull out the one thing is 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 not enough, but but Commissioner Galinsky Victor said something about everything connects to everything else. So let's look at three key events. We have three mile island. So what was unanticipated there? That a small open valve could lead to the problem. Chernobyl. It wasn't a nuclear criticality accident. It was a steam explosion having to do with quote unquote some testing the operators were doing. Coupled with the fact that the plants, you know, uh, steam and, and coefficients of reactivity, you know, could make it spin out of control. Third, Fukushima. Now that was triggered by an earthquake and a major tsunami. And so this whole idea, whether it's within the given system or the interaction with a larger system, has to do with understanding intersecting vulnerabilities that are sources of risk that can have cascading consequences if there's a triggering event. And one thing that compounded the Fukushima problem was where they had their backup energy supplies when the off-site grid was destroyed. 
And so one really has to have a framework within which one can think about how these things play off of each other. And that's what risk-informed performance-based regulation is about at its root, but looking at the intersections. But in the case of things like what happened in Ukraine, we called it the Ukraine at the time, that was a classic example of certain intersecting vulnerabilities, but when, they, when it became the, one of the newly independent states, it was left without its design basis documentation. So that had to be reconstructed, but it had to be reconstructed in a geopolitical framework in which people were also concerned about nuclear non-proliferation, securing nuclear materials, what authorities these regulators had. And so I'm, I'm trying to say that let's be excited about the opportunity, but let's not drink the Kool-Aid so that we don't understand how things intersect and interact in actual engineering systems, in human systems, and in geopolitical systems. Dr. Meserve, there's two subject areas I would love to talk to you, with you endlessly about, but I'm gonna be selfish and ask the one that I wanna talk about. And that's, um, of course, I, we saw a video about the Energy Reorganization Act, but the, one of the other key pieces of uh, legislation that, uh, that shaped who we are today is uh, the Reorganization Plan Number 1 of 1980. And I'm directing this at uh, Dr. Meserve. It, it was an outgrowth of Three Mile Island. Uh, but Dr. Meserve, uh, while Three Mile Island was going on and uh, Dr. Galinsky was suffering through all of that, um, he was a few blocks away uh, 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 working for the White House, working for the uh, uh, science and technical advisor for uh, President Carter. And he was instrumental in uh, uh, the creation of the Kemeny Commission, which did the review of the accident and the NRC. And that uh, Kemeny Commission report made a key uh, observation, and we wouldn't be sitting here if it was implemented. It basically recommended that the NRC be quote unquote abolished and that it be replaced by a single administrator executive uh, agency. Um, and um, that was not what uh, President Carter recommended in, in, the, in the organization plan to Congress. And so um, the plan that of course we have today is what we call today a strong chairman uh, commission with the preservation of the commission. So I guess I wanna ask you, in your view, um, did that plan, that plan, especially about the commission, did it live up to its intent? It was supposed to strengthen the management of the commission, improve safety, and preserve the advantages of the commission form. Yeah, well, let me describe the context a little bit for you. As I was at the time was in working in the White House for the science advisor. And as a result of the Three Mile Island accident, um, President Carter put together a team um, inside the White House, in, uh, including the Department of Energy, to try to address the Three Mile Island issue. And I was very, I was sort of the principal staff person for a group that was chaired by the science advisor, who at the time was Frank Press. And um, the co-chair of that effort was actually from the Department of Energy. It turned out to be John Deutsch, who was the, then the head of the Office of Energy Research. Um, and this group decided we should establish the Kemeny Commission. Um, and I was very much involved in both the selection of the members and also in uh, receiving the report and then being part of the White House process to evaluate it. Kemeny Commission made about 30 recommendations. One of them, as you noted, was uh, that the NRC should be replaced by a single administrator. That recommendation was driven solely by the uh, perception that the uh, NRC as a commission had been slower than responding than was ideal because of the need to get five votes to be able to do anything. And so the, uh, the, the, the idea of a single administrator was to deal with an accident, you'd have one person in charge. Um, 
President Carter, uh, and I guess I have some responsibility for this, uh, did uh, claimed that he accepted all of the recommendations of the Kemeny Commission, but as to the single administrator, he said he accepted it, but in a different form. <laughs> the, uh, the different form was to retain the commission, but to use reorganization authority to provide the, uh, that the chairman would have uh, special powers in the event of an accident. I think that was the right thing to do because I think commission operates effectively across the wide range of things that five minds are gonna be better than one. Uh, the debate that occurs, the fact that it's both Republicans and Democrats are commissioner gives you some political cover and relationships and so forth that can be very important for succeeding. So I think that the decision that was made with regard to that recommendation was exactly the right one. A amusing sort of counterpart of this is that um, the chairman, as I noted, was given special powers in the event of an accident. The only chairman who's ever exercised that power was me. <laughs> <laughs> and it was as a result, I was the chairman during 9-11. And the general counsel made what I think was a very brave uh, decision that this would count as an accident, uh, that, that we should prepare for that and, the, the, and that the chairman should have special powers. And needless to say, my fellow commissioners all agreed that under the circumstances, this was something where I should act, have the power to act alone, which I did. Thanks for watching. 